So first I would like to thank you everyone for being here and thank the organizers of the conference for uh, selecting my proposal. Um, today I'll be interested in the question of the debate between sentientism and non-sentientism as a criterion for moral considerability. So what I'll be interested in is candidacy for moral considerability. I'm not going to be concerned with whether uh, sentient or non-sentient entity are actual uh, bearers of moral considerability, but whether uh, it can, uh, they can be seen as candidates for moral considerability, which I, uh, or in other words, uh, um, about whether the notion that moral agents have moral obligations towards non-sentient entities can be meaningful. So I'll be interested in the meaningfulness aspect, because uh, uh, I think it's the first question that uh, has to be answered. Uh, before we uh, then proceed to uh, uh, consider the second question, which is whether we should acknowledge them as morally considerable entities. Um, the usual criterion uh, among environmental ethicists for uh, candidacy for moral considerability has been considered to be being able to benefit from the states of affairs that occur in the world, or uh, in other words, having a good of one's own, a good that is the good of the entity that uh, we're wondering uh, uh, whether it is uh, uh, it, it should be uh, considered as a uh, uh, whether it should be morally considered. Uh, so, uh, and even more specifically, I'll be interested in one particular argumentative strategy that uh, has been used in environmental ethics. Uh, perhaps is the strategy that has been used by most environmental ethicists, which is the extensionist strategy, which proceeds by attempting to extend the notion of interest to non-sentient entities. Uh, uh, so uh, to extend the uh, paradig paradigmatic notion of welfare that applies to obvious bearers of moral considerability to other entities whose moral considerability is uh, at stake. So I think interest to be uh, the notion of uh, having a good of one's own that applies to paradigm sentient beings. And what extension is do is they try to uh, show that the same notion should be uh, considered to be also applicable to non-sentient entities. Um, so some biocentrists uh, argue that individual organisms have interest and for this reason are candidates to more considerability. Some holists have uh, uh, formulated similar arguments for uh, ecological homes. Uh, and I think that the most, the best articulated version of this notion of non-sentient good of one's own uh, is Gary Barner's notion of biological interest. So uh, I would think that uh, this notion uh, among the uh, extensionist environmental philosopher is the clearest articulation of the notion of interest that could apply to non-sentient entities. So biological interest, uh, interest that uh, some entities would have qua biological entities. And of course, not all environmental ethicists have adopted the extensionist strategy. An important uh, exception uh, is uh, John Bert Gallicott, who defended the moral considerability of ecological holes, but through a detour via moral sentiments. And uh, today, um, what I want to do is to uh, uh, criticize the uh, extensionist strategy to show that it's meant to fail, and therefore to reinforce the need for a strategy that's closer to the one adopted by John Derek Calicott in his work. Uh, um, so a strategy that is not expansionist, that uh, does not proceed by uh, attempting to show that the same notion of having a good of one's own applies to both sentient and non-sentient entities. So my method will be to discuss what I call the extensionist claim and argue on the basis of some research trends in moral psychology that non-sentientists in environmental ethics need not defend the extensionist claim. And what is the extensionist claim? It's the idea that the kind of good that applies to individual organisms and ecological wholes is more similar to the kind of goal, good that characterizes uh, sentient entities than it is to the kind of good that characterizes uh, machines, artifacts, uh, which are also functionally, functionally organized entities. So what I'm going to uh, propose today is that uh, non-sentientists need not defend this extensionist claim. Uh, 
and that they can bite the bullet and accept that probably the kind of good of one's own that applies to individ non-sentient individual organisms holds is closer to the kind of good that applies to machines than to the kind of good that applies to um, uh, sentient, um, <coughs> sentient organisms. And an advantage of this strategy, I think, is that it allows to reconcile two intuitions which uh, uh, are at the basis of the great divide between sentientist and non-sentientist uh, in ethics. The intuition, the battle-centric intuition that sentience confers a special kind of good of one's own that non-sentient beings don't have, with the biocentrist intuition that claims that non-sentient uh, here it should be non-sentient biological entities or living beings have a good of their own in virtue of their being functionally organized entities in such a way that they can function more or less well. And uh, the way I think those two intuitions can be reconciled is by saying that those point to two different kinds of good, two different ways in which uh, something can be good for an entity. Uh, and that uh, the first notion of good is the paradigmatic notion of interest that applies to sentient entities. And another notion is necessary for non-sentient living entities, which I think is health. What we're, uh, uh, the concept that's behind our um, statements that something can be good for a plant or something can be good for an ecosystem, I think can be interpreted as statements that say that some states of affair promote the health of uh, those ecosystems, uh, those organisms. It has nothing to do, uh, I will say, with the notion of interest. Those are two different notions. But I will also argue that, or I at least suggest, that it, it is not because those are two different kinds of good, that only sentient-based good of one's own matters uh, morally. Uh, those may be two different kinds of good, but they might be both morally relevant, and I'll give some reasons uh, in favor of uh, uh, the, the non sequitur that's here, uh, that this does not entail that only this kind of good uh, can be morally relevant. So, <coughs> um, my, uh, the outline of my talk for today, um, <coughs> I will start by uh, talking about Wayne Sumner's challenge to the idea that non sentient entities can have a good of their own. I think Sumner's challenge is perhaps the best uh, articulated or the most serious challenge that uh, non-scientists are facing. And then I'll consider two possible ways to respond to Sumner, either trying to refute his argument or, uh, uh, in the third section, conceding his argument and uh, trying to claim that his argument does not entail that non sentientism is an, in environmental and ethics is hopeless. So first, Sumner's challenge. Uh, just before considering Sumner's challenge, uh, I think I have to situate it with respect to two broad strategies that have been used by non-sentientists, that by extension is non-sentientists in environmental ethics, uh, which are uh, most of the time biocentrists. The first one, uh, those biocentrists will claim that there's a similarity, a strong similarity between uh, the notion of the natural teleology, the natural goal-directedness that can be observed uh, in non-sentient entities, and the notion that the, the phenomenon that sentient beings can have goals. So they will plead that those two notions are so similar that, that there's no reason to draw a line between having goals consciously and having goals non-sentiently. And uh, I will set aside this strategy because it seems to me that it's just gonna, it's gonna be a matter of my, intu my, my intuition is stronger than yours. It seems that there's no way that sentientists and non-sentientists will agree about this. Non-sentientists will plead this and sentientists will just say, no, no, no. What makes some goals, uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, makes that some goals matter morally is that they are consciously pursued goals. And I, I don't think that uh, uh, sentientists will give up on that claim, and that non-sentientists will give up on the claim that's here. So I, I don't think uh, uh, there's much of a discussion that can occur if we focus on this. And I think that um, uh, another strategy is more likely 
to allow a discussion between sentientists and non-sentientists. And it's this strategy here, which does not focus that much on the natural teleology, but on functionality in the biological world. And of course, functionality and teleology are connected, so the difference here is a matter of emphasis. And here the strategy is to derive normativity from uh, the notion of natural function, from the observation that biological entities and eventually ecosystems can function more or less well. And by uh, considering those, uh, this normativity that arises from uh, functional uh, understanding of uh, their dynamics provides a form of normativity from which can be derived an idea that states of affair that affect those entities can be good or bad for them. Um, <clears throat> and I think if we start from, with, from this assumption, then, uh, uh, then uh, uh, we, we can go further in the discussion between sentientists and non-sentientists. And the way to go further, I think, is to consider Sumner's objection to non-sentientism, Sumner's challenge to the idea that non-sentient entities can have a good of their own. And Sumner's challenge proceeds by distinguishing two different notions of having a good of one's own. Prudential goodness for some things, some states of affairs being good for some entities in the prudential sense, meaning that they promote, uh, they make an entity better off, they promote what's in an entity's interest. And perfectionist goodness for, which according to Sumner is a different notion of goodness for, um, and then that which promotes an entity's being a good specimen of its kind, its functional excellence. And Sumner's claim is that, well, of course, in ordinary language, it's totally natural to say that some states of affair can be good for plants, or perhaps even for ecosystems. And this is what motivates biocentrists and ecocentrists to say that states of affair uh, can be good for non-sentient entities. But he says, I can explain away this intuition by saying the kind of good that's involved is perfectionist goodness, it's not prudential goodness. So when we say that something is good for a plant, we're not saying that it makes the plant better off. The plant cannot be better off, according to Sumner, because uh, it's not sentient. We're speaking about what promotes the, the plant's uh, biological excellence, what allows it to function uh, uh, in better conformity to uh, its kind. And uh, for today, I will assume that here, at least Sumner is reversing the burden of proof. And he uh, uh, creates a situation where the non-sentientist has to uh, uh, respond to this, has the burden of proving that what's at stake uh, um, uh, <clears throat> when uh, we, we're speaking of the good of plants or of ecosystem, it is not perfectionist goodness that's involved. If the non-sentientist wants to reject Sumner's argument, it is to the non-sentientist to provide an argument. Uh, of course, another strategy would be to buy the bullet, and this is, at the end of my talk, the strategy which uh, I will uh, argue is the most promising. <clears throat> so the notion of perfectionist goodness, Aristotelian attributive goodness, x is a good x if and only x, if x functions as a normal token of its kind. And this would be the notion of goodness for that applies to non-sentient entities according to Sumner. So this brings us back to an early statement by Tom Regan in the debate uh, uh, between uh, uh, animal ethics and biocentrism. The sense in which water is good for a plant is the same, is essentially the same sense as the sense in which oil is good for a car. It's uh, uh, about what promotes an entity's functioning uh, according to its kind. And here, maybe some would want to say, oh, but there's a difference in the case of the, the, the engine, or in the case of a car. The interests involved are the interests of the user, and so it's not really good for the engine itself. It's strongly derivative from the interest of the users. But I don't think that this kind of argument works. I think here, in the case of machines, we also need this uh, Aristotelian notion, because um, uh, to take uh, uh, to borrow an argument to uh, from from Basil and Sander, if I put a laptop here to hold the door, this would not uh, instantly make it good for the laptop that I put it there. 
you're not following my, my example. But, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I'll leave. I'll leave it. Examples are supposed to be illuminating. <laughs> if I have to explain my example, the example just failed. <coughs> okay. Um, um, so I, I mentioned Foreigner's notion of biological interest earlier. And it could seem to some that the notion of biological interest articulated by Wagner does not involve the Aristotelian notion of good of one's kind. It's based on past natural selection. So Wagner uh, 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 draws on the uh, selected effect theory of function that has been popular in philosophy of biology and derives a notion of the good of non-sentient entities. X is good for the entity E if and only if X promotes the ability of X's parts to exhibit their naturally, their naturally selected effect. So the idea is that being good for a non-sentient entity, uh, entity is promoting uh, uh, its ability to function as it was selection, selected to function, as its ancestors were selected to function in the past. So it does, this doesn't seem to involve any reference to a kind, etc. But I think, in fact, it does. Um, uh, or at least if one wants to eliminate the way in which some normativity could be grounded in natural selection, one has to uh, invoke uh, a relation to kinds. Because um, as McLaughlin uh, has argued in, in criticism of the selected effect theory function, it, has, it is not immediately evident why the causal past, the causal selective past of a tree should determine his normative future, how the trait ought to be. And I think what's implicit in the selected effect theory of function is uh, a notion of uh, natural kindness that is grounded in past natural selection. So here again, I think it's uh, Sumner's notion of perfection is goodness that's at stake. So the implication of Sumner's challenge, I think, is that uh, um, the essentialist, the, the extensionist claim is reversed, and that, uh, in fact, the kind of good that applies to individual organisms or ecosystems is more similar to the kind of good that applies to machines than to the kind of good that applies to sentient entities. <clears throat> Three possible responses to Sumner. A first one would be to refute Sumner and argue that function-based goodness for it can be can lead and ground a form of function of prudential goodness. It's, that it's not it does not necessarily lead to perfectionist goodness. Another possible response would be to say, well, we should just get rid of the notion of goodness for having good of one's own and develop an environmental ethics that is not focused on any notion of welfare. Uh, develop an environmental ethics which is focused on some values about the natural world that ought to be promoted for their own sake, independently of any uh, allusion to a good of one's own, of uh, some entity. And a third uh, strategy could be to concede Sumner's distinction between prudential and perfectionist goodness and argue that a non sentientist environmental ethics can be articulated around the notion of perfectionist goodness, that this uh, does not entail that uh, uh, an environmental ethics cannot uh, work. Uh, so in the section two of my talk, I will focus on the first strategy and uh, present what I think is the best version of this strategy and show that it fails. And in the last or last section before the conclusion, I will uh, uh, explore this strategy. Uh, strategy two, I'll leave it aside. I think it would raise uh, different kinds of questions. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Greg Michelson's richness theory is a strong contender for this strategy to avoid uh, um, uh, Sumner's uh, objections, but uh, I will uh, rather explore the third uh, strategy uh, in my presentation. So refuting Sumner, I think that <coughs> the most plausible uh, account of biological interest that can be invoked in response to Sumner's distinction is uh, what some uh, environmental philosophers have called the topoietic account of biological interest. So this account is different from Varner's in that it does not attempt to ground biological normativity in past natural selection. 
it grounds it instead in the notion of autopoiesis, the notion that individual organisms and eventually uh, ecological wholes are self-maintaining entity. It draws on Kant's idea that organisms are ends in themselves, they're self-promoting entities, or in other words, they're both cause and effects of themselves. Um, or in other words, what's special with living entities, what distinguishes uh, living entities for, from inert entities is that their activities are oriented towards their own self-maintenance. Uh, this would be what is the fundamental difference between uh, <coughs> organisms and inert uh, artifacts. Of course, if we have organism artifacts, synthetic organism, then the, the line will be blurred. Uh, we might consider this uh, case in the question period. So, if we uh, uh, take this approach, then we can ground a distinction between the good of artifacts and the good of organisms. What is good for an artifact is what promotes their activity normal to their kind, whereas what is good for living entities is what promotes their self-maintenance. And so here we would have uh, a, a distinction, a difference in kind in the uh, way in which things can be good for those two types of entities and therefore have a way to respond to Sumner in the following way by just uh, classifying entities differently with respect to its distinction between prudential goodness for and perfectionist goodness for. So prudential goodness for, what makes an entity better off? what's in its interest, and uh, this uh, notion would apply in this case to both sentient and non-sentient living entities because those are all autopoietic entities, entities that are self-maintaining. Uh, I'll return uh, 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 in a few slides uh, to the question of whether uh, really we can consider ecosystems as autopoietic entities. <clears throat> so what promotes their self-maintenance would be what, they're, what is good for them, and here it seems that we have a notion of goodness for that does not involve any relation to being conformed to one's kind. So it seems closer to Sumner's notion of prudential goodness. And perfectionist goodness for would uh, <coughs> be the only kind of goodness for that applies to artifacts. Of course, those entities too have a perfectionist goodness for, but insofar as in uh, 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 an approach to ethics, like Sumner's, prudential goodness for is what is relevant for moral considerability. It does not matter that perfectionist goodness for applies to them. What matters is that those have a prudential goodness and therefore they are candidates to moral considerability, whereas uh, machines don't have a prudential goodness and therefore are not candidates to moral considerability. <coughs> so to summarize the difference between uh, biological entities and artifacts, uh, according to the autopoietic account, biological entities maintain their parts while inert artifacts do not. The activities of biological entities are oriented towards the maintenance of their own parts. They are both cause and effects of themselves. <coughs> and biological entities are the goal of their own activities, while activities proper to their kind are the goals of the activities or of artifacts. So, seems that the two types of entities have a good of their own in a different sense. But is it really so? Should we buy the autopoietic account of biological entities and uh, think that uh, it can ground a notion of good of one's own that's different from the kind that applies to artifacts, different from perfectionist goodness? Limitations. Uh, one limitation of the autopoietic account uh, with respect to organisms uh, I think it can be illuminated by uh, remembering uh, a remark bar by Carl Ample on the, uh, the underdetermination of the notion of survival as it's sometimes used in biological theory. He says, in reference to, biological organism, to a biological organism, the term survival has a fairly clear meaning, though even here, uh, there is a need for further clarification, for when we speak of the biological needs or requirements, we construe these not as conditions uh, of just the barest survival, but as conditions of persistence in or return to a normal or healthy state 
or to a state in which a system is a properly functioning whole. So in other words, it seems that intuitively the good of an organism is not mere self-maintenance, but the maintenance of certain capacities. It's not just bare survival, but uh, survival in some good state. And therefore self-maintenance itself is not all there is, uh, does not ground all the normativity we seem to intuitively need with respect to organisms. So maintenance of certain capacities, presumably capacities normal to its kind, and therefore the autopoiesis account with respect to organism fails to avoid defining non-sentient good in terms of kinds, in relation to kinds. Uh, <clears throat> limitations of the autopoietic account uh, in the case of ecosystems, uh, I think uh, we can consider uh, considering two aspects of what uh, Bert Kallikot has called the constructive ecology will indicate that the autopoietic account does not work well for ecosystems. First, the ecological role of disturbances in the ecological world. Uh, since the end of the 70s and it crystallized in the uh, 80s, there's a research program in ecology which focuses on the, the, the role of disturbances for the maintenance of ecosystems. Fires are needed for the maintenance of some forest ecosystems. Uh, wave disturbances are necessary for the maintenance of many intertidal ecosystems. And how does this challenge the autopoietic account? According to the autopoietic account, <coughs> entities are maintain their parts, and their parts are what maintain the entity. There's a sort of circular causality, which is not there in the case of disturbances, because the disturbances which maintain the system are not themselves maintained by the system. There might be exceptions from some, for some forest fires. Some forest fires, some, for, some forest ecosystems that are composed of species which promote fire. And in that sense, we can think of a circular causality. But it's not the case about all ecosystems that are maintained by disturbances. So I think uh, we must conclude that ecosystems are uh, maintained in large part by allogenic factors uh, instead of autogenic factors and therefore are in some sense heteropoietic instead of autopoietic. And the second uh, limitation of the autopoietic account with respect to ecosystem, the issue of multiple equilibria in ecology. There is a trend of research, there's a research program in ecology which looks at how uh, an ecosystem can be in different uh, uh, stable states, different resilient state, uh, and uh, very often some state is considered to be the healthy state of the ecosystem, and if you perturb the ecosystem too much, it will uh, shift to another uh, resilience uh, basin of attraction, and this new basin of attraction is often considered as degraded compared to the first one. So this indicates that uh, from the perspective of ecologists at least, some ecosystems which are equally resilient, the two stable states can be equally stable, equally resilient, but some of the, the states will be considered to be degraded compared to the other. So it suggests that ecosystems can maintain themselves in degraded states and that ability for self-maintenance is not sufficient for uh, being in a good state. Promoting a state, uh, promoting states of affairs which allow all ecosystems to maintain themselves would not necessarily be good to all ecosystems because some of those ecosystems would be promoted uh, to be maintained, would be maintained in uh, degraded states. So we're back to Sumner's view. Prudential goodness for seems applicable to sentient beings what promotes their pleasure or non-suffering and or preference satisfaction depending on which account of well-being uh, one prefers. And perfectionist goodness for would apply to natural and artifactual non-sentient entities what promote their functioning according to their kind. So another strategy to respond to Sumner, I think, is just to bite the bullet. So a proposal, non-sentient this, instead of trying to respond to Sumner and try to argue that uh, uh, organisms and ecosystems have interests in the same sense as sentient beings have interests, they should bite the bullet and attempt to develop an environmental ethics 
focused on non-sentient entities, but invoking the, 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 the perfection is goodness of non-sentient entities. So except that the extension is claim fails. Uh, and uh, one uh, um, uh, indication toward, towards this direction is Judith Jarvis Thompson's distinction of two notions of goodness for which seem to match with, um, um, uh, with Sumner's two notions. So she says, goodness for, something can be said to be good for, in the sense that it's good, good for why, in this case, in the sense that it's conductive to wise welfare. But something can be said to be conductive to uh, wise good, in the sense of wise being in good condition. And here it seems to be closer to Sumner's perfectionist goodness. Or I think what we could choose to call it uh, in the case of biological entities, and here I would have to inject uh, many resources from the philosophy of medicine on the concept of health. It's part of my research, but I cannot uh, dig into this today. But the idea here would be that in the case of uh, dynamic entities, uh, just like uh, um, biological organisms or ecological wholes, the notion, the important notion would be, would be uh, promoting their being in good conditions, which could be called uh, their being in a in healthy state, in a healthy uh, condition. So non-sentient, uh, non-sentientist ethic should, uh, ethicists should argue that moral agents ought to promote the health of biological entities, but not because this is in their interest. Uh, they should just avoid any talk of interest uh, just by the bullet that non-sentient entities do not have interest. What they have is they can be more or less functioning well in more or less healthy states. So not because their health is in their interest, but because it is intrinsically good for them. In Thompson's second sense, in the sense that it's promotive or of their being in good condition. What a non-sentientist uh, want in uh, uh, relation to humans or moral agents' actions uh, um, in relation to ecosystems and uh, other non-sentient entities is promoting states of affair in which those entities are in healthy states. <clears throat> so, um, uh, uh, I think that this resonates really well with the notion of land health that was articulated first by Aldo Leopold, but that uh, came back in the 90s in a uh, slightly different version in the terminology of ecosystem health. So in this literature, there's no suggestion to my knowledge that we should promote ecosystem health because it's in the interest of ecosystem. It's just ecosystem health is intrinsically valuable. Uh, uh, it's something that we should seek to promote if uh, we uh, uh, ascribe, if we think that ecosystems have intrinsic value. Of course, we could also think we ought to promote ecosystem health for its instrumental values, uh, but uh, this is the kind of goodness that uh, is sufficient to uh, uh, articulate um, uh, a non-instrumental uh, uh, ecological ethics, ecocentric ethics. So I think that what makes this seem implausible is a presupposition behind extensionist approaches, and this presupposition can be highlighted if we uh, adopt a moral psychology perspective on environmental ethics, and more specifically, uh, if we uh, consider the emotions that uh, might undergird our attitudes uh, of intrinsic valuations of uh, 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 various entities. And I think that the presupposition between extensionist approaches is that only proper objects of sympathy or compassion can be candidates to moral considerability because those are the only uh, entities that have mental states with which we can sympathize. Um, so if it were the case that only uh, entities, only proper objects of sympathy could be morally candidates to moral considerability, then of course only sentient entities, only entities that can be said to have interests uh, in, in, in the same sense as uh, uh, sentient entities have interest, could be candidates to moral considerability. But I think that this is a too narrow picture of what ethics can be. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in a previous paper, building on Schweder's work in empirical moral psychology, 
Uh, I argue that the scope of what environmental ethics can be is broader than, than that, is broader than our sympathetic concern for uh, other sentient entities. Uh, um, Schweder's research indicates that there are three uh, moral domains that uh, the, if, we, if we study uh, the various culture, moral cultures around the world, we can see that although uh, Western ethics has been focused on the autonomy domain, the duties that we think we have uh, towards uh, individuals, which are usually sentient entities, uh, out of sympathy, is just one of the moral domains that characterizes um, uh, human moral sensibility, and that there are also two other moral domains, which are focused on different entities than individuals, uh, community or the duties we feel we have towards the community and the duties we feel we have towards the natural order, community and natural order being two uh, um, non-sentient objects of moral consider consideration. In, in that paper, looking back at the uh, history of environmental ethics, I uh, uh, use Schweder's model to situate the work of biocentrists in the autonomy domain of ethics, as I just mentioned, Calicut's approach to ecocentrism uh, as based in the community domain through an analogy between the biotic community and the human community. And so uh, 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 ecocentrism would be undergirded by the, the same kind of sentiments we feel towards the community, uh, belonging to the community, community bonded, bondage. So the biotech community is a proper object of sentiments of community bondage, therefore, we moral agents have to take it. It's good into account in our deliberation. And in that paper, I propose an alternative, eco, which involves uh, sentiments that uh, uh, have more to do with the third domain, uh, uh, ethical domain of Schweder, uh, uh, the ethics of the natural order, centered around um, sentiments of awe and wonder. Ecosystems are objects of our sentiments of awe and wonder. And therefore, we moral agents ought to take their good into account in our moral deliberation. So for now, the, which one of those approaches is the most possible is not important. What's, what's important for my argument today is that those are, two, uh, those are grounded in two different ethical domains than uh, uh, the one that's specific for sentient entities, the autonomy domain, and that those domains are part of human moral uh, sensibility. They are part of what uh, is considered to be the realm of ethics uh, in many cultural perspectives. So there doesn't seem to be any reason to restrict ethics to our duties to uh, sentient entities. So conclusion, summary. Many non-sentientists adopt an extensionist argumentative strategy which requires them to defend the, what I call the extensionist claim according to which the good of non-sentient entities is more similar to that of sentient organisms and to artifacts. Sumner's distinction between prudential and perfectionist goodness suggests that the extensionist claim is false. The autopoiesis account of biological interest seems to offer a plausible defense of the extensionist claim against Sumner's challenge, but it ultimately fails. And therefore, non-sentientist environmental ethics should be developed around the notion of health, conceived as biological perfection, instead of a notion of interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoine. So I will take a cue of questions again. Uh, I'll start with Dominic. Okay. This is just a question of clarification. Like, did you say at one point that, um, say, health of an ecosystem, we shouldn't, it's not that it's in its interest, so that it has an interest in health, but it is intrinsically good for the ecosystem yeah. to be healthy. Um, it's not that it's intrinsically good for the ecosystem to be healthy, because then I would have to define what is good for an ecosystem in terms of something else than health. Mm -hmm. So my claim is more that being good for an ecosystem just is being promotive of ecosystem health. So uh, the claim is that there is a semantic equivalence between the two expressions, or at least a conceptual equivalence between the two expressions. Got it. Josh, is your, your follow-up, is that on yeah. So then, uh, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So then, yeah, so, so do things go better for ecosystems when there are conditions that are pro promotive of health? 
of their health. Yeah, their health. Things go better for them. Yeah, that, that, that would be the direct application of the proposal, yeah. Okay. But it's better for them. Well, it's... Health is constitutive of their good. Yeah, okay. It's not instrumental for their good in my proposal. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, but not because there's a causal relation between the two, but because the two ideas are equivalent. But things go better for them when they're healthier. Uh, since they're better off with their... Yeah, yeah. Do you still want to follow up, Joel? Yeah, so I, I'm seriously struggling with this. I'm not sure I understand the distinction between uh, um, X is intrinsically good for A and X is in A's interests. Mm. This, you, you seem to be pausing that there is a vastly different thing going on here. And I, I'm not sure I understand okay. this. So, so I, I think that uh, here uh, terminology is uh, 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 unstable. So. A different way to say the same thing would be to say that there are two notions of being in interest of something. Uh, and uh, one is the kind that applies to sentient entities and one is the one that applies to non-sentient entities. So that I think it's, so there's a part of stipulation there in, the, in terms of how to use the, the terms. But uh, uh, I think that no matter how we use the terms, there's uh, uh, an important distinction between two different kinds of goods. Uh, good in the sense of promotive of uh, uh, metal states that have positive value and promotive of good functioning, normal functioning. I think it's, it's two different notions. And I, I think at least that uh, uh, accepting that it's two different notions helps uh, reconciling the uh, uh, pathocentrist intuition and the biocentrist intuition uh, in a way that those intuitions could not be reconciled if we, if we don't stipulate this. Do, do humans have both then? Um, do humans I, have good functioning and good interests? I, I would think that qua uh, biological entity, so if you abstract completely my mental states, you can speak of my health, and you can speak of what is promotive of my health, so what is good for my, for my body or for the organism, uh, uh, that I am. Uh, uh, so, of, yes, you can do it, but I'm just claiming that saying that something is good for uh, my body in this sense does not entail anything directly uh, about what's in my interest. In many cases, there might be a convergence between the two because being healthy is instrumentally good for uh, uh, being prudentially in a good state. Uh, uh, but there might be uh, cases in which it's in my better interest not to be healthy. Mm -hmm. But um, Schrader uh, and, well, first of all, uh, moral psychology reports to be a science. And um, Schrader and Jonathan Haidt and so on uh, seem to, to have this sort of progressive sense of the domains. Schrader has three, mm -hmm. at a certain point height had five, now he has seven. Uh, so you would think that the science would be less sort of fluid and kind of self-inventive as it, as it goes along. So first of all, it seems to me that the, the science of moral psychology is a little shaky. Uh, as, as a science. And secondly, from the perspective of uh, philosophers, uh, it's descriptive, not normative. And so, um, what's the relevance of that to uh, ethics? And of course, I think there is no relevance, and I think that normativity can be teased out of a a science of ethics, a descriptive uh, account. But I'd like to hear what you, uh, how you would approach that issue. Okay. So it, it seems to me that uh, a good way to articulate and test ethical theory is to seek to reconcile intuitions and to seek to find the best reflexive equilibrium among the intuitions uh, that. Uh, uh, 
seem important about ethics. And I think that uh, although, of course, uh, moral psychology as a science is shaky and is likely, uh, the theories are likely to be replaced by other theories in the future, I think at least it's better to base our construction of ethical theories on that kind of research than to base it only on our own philosophers' intuitions about what ethics can be. Perhaps both will be important, but if we if we if our only basis is the intuition we in this room have about what ethics can be, we're likely to uh, uh, be uh, over-centered on some specific, some culturally specific moral sensibility. And I think moral psychology can help us um, uh, decenter ourselves from uh, the uh, biases of the culture that uh, we receive. So here, Schweller's model, I think, is interesting because it, uh, it is really useful in indicating that uh, the uh, dominant moral sensibility of uh, Western philosophy is uh, very narrow compared to what counts as uh, the moral realm in uh, other cultural traditions. So that, that's why I think it's useful. Can I follow up just, just briefly? Uh, just, just briefly. Um, I think you're right about uh, uh, philosophers today bringing their intuitions. They also bring a considerable history of uh, analysis of ethics that is completely sort of centered in the Western tradition, doesn't take into account other culture. So, so just sort of adding to your observation. Um, at the back there. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, this might be the same issue that came up earlier, about why the, the perfectionist notion is a notion of good for rather than of good. Um, and so I've been sort of struggling to like find different ways that, that, mm -hmm. to articulate this. Um, here's, here's my best description of what's puzzling me. It seems like in the sentientist account, I have a really clear way to draw that distinction. Right, so um, you know what's good for the dog is sort of tied to the dog's subjective point of view in the world, and what's good can be sort of about other stuff. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what grounds the the good forness in the case uh -huh. of something like an ecosystem. Um, and maybe maybe I'm sort of asking you about your account of health, which you uh -huh. don't want to get into. I'm not sure, but but I was I kept thinking like, oh, this is really just an account of you know intrinsic value, not intrinsic. Uh -huh. So I think I, I, I would agree that in the case of prudential goodness and sentient goodness, the link between state of affairs being promotive of some entity's pleasure to uh, state, of, state of affairs being good for them is, is quite obvious. And I would grant that it's not that obvious in the case of perfectionist goodness. I think that the link can be defended by a kind of convergence to best explanation in the sense that our linguistic intuitions are such that uh, we say that states of affairs can be good for non-sentient entities. And uh, if we look at the philosophy of biology and what has been said there about functions and about functional statements being normative, there seems to be uh, 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 at least a strong candidate there to elucidate our ordinary language that states of affairs can be good to non-sentient entities. And I, I would say, in absence of other contender, this seems to be the best way to explain our uh, linguistic intuitions. Um, did you want to? No. I guess one just quick thing. I, I would be tempted to say this is sort of good involving ecosystems, rather than good for. But anyway, this is maybe that's just my intuition. That, that health is a good that involves ecosystems, it's a good in the world that's about ecosystems, but not good for, but okay. anyway. It, yeah, so I guess we can talk more. I'm, I'm going to abuse my position in the queue at this point, just to uh, ask a, a okay. brief follow-up follow to something that I think is closely related. So, I want to know why it doesn't extend to other kinds of um, non-biological um, entities. Uh -huh. Because it seems like ordinary language, language permits us to talk of good for knives, good for tables, yeah. good for chairs. Um, so I, I think, and I think you did cover it, but I think I may have missed what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so this second notion of goodness for the question, if I understand properly, 
is why does not it apply to non-biological or uh, non-biologically related entities? And uh, I would say this notion of uh, goodness for it can't apply to any entity that's functionally organized, even a mechanical entity, even an artifact like a, a computer or an engine and stuff like that. Except that I don't think that the word health would apply in that in that case. So health would be uh, and it it might be here a, a more of a terminological issue, but it, it would seem that uh, an illuminating stipulation about the use of language would be to uh, speak of uh, uh, some functional entities being in a good condition in a broad sense, and then when those entities are dynamic entities, self-maintaining entities, so this is something that I would retain from the autopoiesis account, even though I don't think it grounds all the normativity we need. It still draws, I think, an, an interesting distinction between purely mechanical entities that don't maintain their parts and uh, living entities that maintain their part, and I would restrict the use of the word health to entities which maintain their power. So it's still this more closer to this notion of goodness for, but it's uh, as, as a matter of terminolog terminological stipulation or accommodating ordinary language, it seems to me that it's better to uh, restrict health to uh, biological or autopoietic entities. Okay, I will maybe talk to you about that. I'll <laughs> okay. ask you later, but so uh, who do I have next? Tatiana? Yeah, I actually have the same question. Okay. <laughs> Are you, because it is that part of the explanation uh, uh, that you bring in the self maintenance as well. So, down over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd just like to come back to the last step you take in trying to recognize moral consideration to like ecosystem and everything through emotion. Um, so, if I understood well, you say we have awe for well functioning, so healthy ecosystems. And you, so is the next step you take is that this uh, gives them moral consideration in virtue of the, the three different moral domains that you presented? Uh, yeah, I did not think to make that point, but just to indicate how I think the point should be made. But okay, that, okay, so that's not your position. It's no, that's, my, that's what I want to argue eventually. Okay. But here I'm totally aware that there are many leaps in the argument. So it's just a, a, a general sketch of how I think uh, non-sentientists should attempt to ground the moral considerability of non-sentient entities. Can I just add something? Of course. Um, so in the autonomous domain and sympathy, it's easy to see why you can use moral consider considerability because sympathy answers to a moral value, suffering of others. I can see how we could stretch that to this group belonging sentiment in a way. But in R, clearly answers to a aesthetic value and a moral value, and so I wonder how how you 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 do that step. I'm curious uh, to see yeah, how yeah. you do it. But, so um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I um, Yes. Yeah, so uh, so this is also stuff that I would need to develop. But um, uh, it seems to me that in those discussions in aesthetics on the uh, uh, notion of uh, beautiful and the sublime. It seems to me that one important difference between the sublime and the beautiful, some people point to terror, but I don't think that it's the uh, uh, most important ingredient. It seems to me that it's a sense of sacredness uh, ascribed to uh, the thing that uh, we uh, uh, aesthetically perceive as sublime. And this sense of sacredness, I would think, is connected to a duty of respect. And so this is. Uh, how I would want to uh, make the connection. But of course, uh, many things would have to be said. Um, Duncan? Okay. okay. Yeah, so one thing that I like about the extensionist approach is that it identifies, so it identifies an interest that, so like Varner's approach, he identifies an interest that ordinary adult humans have that is shared with non sentient entities. And then he bridges the gap and shows that we can have reasons to promote that kind of interest, even in cases where it doesn't promote. We're doing so doesn't also promote our sentient, uh -huh. our interest grounded in our sentience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're you're thinking of the the smoker's example. The smoker's example, or the yeah, uh, my cat going outside, or 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I guess I'm not seeing how you bridge the normative gap on your account because you're not, you're not looking at something that is shared with or So what I like is that that kind of move can then convince people who are, you know, really stubborn and say, I unless you know, you're not going to move me from um, the case of ordinary adult humans to non-sentient uh, individuals. But then you can, then he does it, right? Then Varner does it by showing we have this interest and that there's a reason to promote the interest. But I don't see how you move, how you bridge that gap since mm -hmm. you're not adopting an extensionist. <coughs> yeah, so uh, uh, how you move that kind of person, you know, that kind of stubborn. Uh, well, it seems to me that your question is not that much how you move that person because moving that person, I think it would be more likely to, I would be more likely to succeed by uh, 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 eliciting some emotional responses yeah. than by uh, uh, exposing a completely rational argument. Yeah. So it seems that uh, your question is more how do you demonstrate to that person that he or she sure. ought. Oh, yeah, that's the way, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's a question of, uh, um, so, so I think in a, in a sentimentalist approach, I, I would have to uh, uh, respond to the challenge of how uh, some emotional responses can be more appropriate than others. Uh, in, if, if I want to avoid the sort of relativism, but, oh, if I feel I'm wandered towards nature, then I have such duty, but if I don't feel it, I don't have such duty. And um, uh, here I think there, there's a challenge, but at the same time, there has been a, a long time assumption uh, in uh, philosophy that emotions are hopelessly irrational and therefore that if an ethic involves emotions then it's gonna lead us to relativism and, and it seems that there is a lot of research uh, now on the importance of emotion for ethics and there are some accounts of emotional ethics which uh, involve a notion of some emotions being more appropriate than others for uh, considerations that uh, have some claim to objectivity. So uh, uh, I think that I could tap on this to uh, develop, uh, to, to answer your kind of concern. I, I don't have an account ready made for now, but I think there are resources that indicate that it's not hopeless uh, uh, as a an argumentative strategy. Um, thank you, Antoine. So this is a, just really hopefully helpful. Um, so whilst I'm a bit unhappy with what some of the capability environmental theorists are doing, uh, with the extension of the capabilities approach in terms of the justice stuff, there's also like another strand of it which actually fits much more in line with what you're saying here. So some people think that um, this bounds capabilities approach, for her there's a lot of focus on the language of awe and wonder. And she, they think, or it's argued, I think by Jeremy Bendit Kainer, that through, um, through wonder we can come to identify dignity, and dignity is in all beings on that view. Okay. I guess so, like, it's just a way of thinking about how, like, how kind of our emotions and the way that we kind of attend to things in the world can help us to kind of uh, see things in a particular way. Whereas, for her, empathy is what enables us to identify those beings who have um, claims on us, right? So that's the justice line. So I guess it kind of fitted with what you wanted to say at the end, where sympathy yeah. was connected to a kind of sentientist uh -huh. um, line, whereas the awe of wonder kind of connected to, or does connect in this family to all. Okay, so I, I, I will definitely ask you for those references because I, I, I really want to tap on those. So that I, I really, uh, um, yeah, you have a connection between uh, our responses of awe as uh, evidence of dignity. Uh, this is where I would like to go. Uh, the second part of, however, uh, restricting justice claims or in another terminology that what would be morally, moral considerability claims uh, to, I, I know it's not exactly the same, so I'll have to look at the literature, but uh, uh, saying that uh, um, uh, entities with which we, we can sympathize have a stronger ethical claim on us, uh, I would well, be inclined to challenge this. They have a type of claim on us, right? So they have a justice claim on us. 
Okay. But the, the beings that have dignity that we can have, we can be in awe of, might still be a source of reasons for us. I guess that's the way I would want to cover it up. But, um, yeah. but okay, but I really want to look at this and. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks a lot. So, for a final question, Tatiana. Yeah, so you said you want to accept the difference between prudential and perfectionist value, and you also like mentioned the two notions of value that Holmes mentioned, like conducive to someone's welfare or conducive to something's being in a good condition. So far, the good, but then you take in this health, and somehow we stick to the second uh, thing to, to living organisms. So you can in with health and you can in with self-maintenance again. And uh, I think that is something that needs to be justified. That's one thing. Yeah. What what statement has to be justified? Well, the, the narrowing down from perfectionist value and Thompson's second kind of value conducive to access being in a good condition, which applies to artifacts. Uh -huh. And then you're narrowing it down by calling it health and by bringing in the self-maintenance aspect again, which makes it not applicable to most artifacts, uh -huh. but only to living beings. Uh -huh. so, uh, so maybe I can clarify that here, uh, the only claim I was making was that there seems to be a qualitative difference between artifacts and uh, uh, living entities in that respect, but uh, uh, there is no claim yet that this uh, difference has moral implications. I think that this distinction itself is not sufficient to ground a moral uh, a difference in moral uh, 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 in terms of moral implications. I, I think that the difference in moral implications would uh, have to be grounded in uh, emotional responses that are appropriate with respect to machines versus uh, uh, living entities. So not that we haven't had, but that are appropriate, so you bring in another more notice thing. Because yeah, 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 well. that we all and wander towards machines. Um, and I, I think most ecocentrists wouldn't like that if we could just as well supplement uh -huh. trees and everything with nice machines that are perhaps imagining themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I haven't cashed out in any way uh, how to make sense of this notion of emotions being appropriate. I was just uh, earlier in the discussion alluding to the fact that some accounts have been provided and that there was some resources for the kind of project that I'm pursuing okay, well then in this literature. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's thank Antoine again. Thank you.